Hassan Saba, Saba, Hassan Saba, Legend of the Assassins. This is the uh, guy in that first video I watched, or the three-part video I did yesterday. It was really interesting, really good. So we're going to cover him and his life and stuff like that. This, uh, hopefully the other video is already out, so you'll know why I'm doing this. Um, before we get started, there's a th thumbs up button. It's right down here. If you click that for me, that'd be tremendous. Subscribe if you'd like to. Um, you can donate to the channel through the thanks button. If you do, you can request a video. Your name will be sponsoring the video. If not, you can donate and not have me do anything. Or you can still request without donating. It just takes a little longer. All right, let's get into the video. Two things before we get started today. Number one, pronunciation trigger warning, everybody. I am absolutely going to ruin some names today. Enjoy. And number two, this video is like 20 minutes long. How often do you see stuff like that on YouTube? Not very often, I will tell you. And we are able to make these super long videos because of amazing companies like Vincero. And if you want to support us and look pretty awesome at the same time, you need to get hooked up with a Vincero. Let's get on with it, shall we? It was not uncommon for political and military leaders of the Seljuk Turks during the 11th and 12th century CE to wake up to a surprise. A dagger firmly planted on the floor next to their bed. Despite the fortress walls, the bolted doors, and the armed guards, somebody had entered their bedroom and left a note. Do as you are told, or the next time the dagger will be planted in your chest. But sometimes, no warning was given. The merciless blade would find its way straight into the heart or the throat of its target. Intimidation and targeting killings of high-profile victims became their hallmark tactics in a protracted and often desperate fight against a powerful invader. They became known as the Assassins, the loyal followers and guardians to the founder and leader of their movement, Hassan Sabah. Hassan and his followers emerged in a confusing and a murky period of political, ethnic, and religious strife in Persia and the Middle East. A period in which different Muslim factions fought each other and also against the European Crusaders. No wonder then that the history emerging from that period is shrouded in myth, legends, and propaganda. So who were the assassins? And what was their agenda? Also, what was their relationship? with the Knights Templar, who was the mysterious old man of the mountain. Well, today I will try to clear these and other questions up by narrating Hassan's life. But first, how did the Assassin's Legend get started in Europe? One of the first written accounts about the Assassins comes from a French priest and historian living in Syria. This was William of Tyre. In the early 1180s, William wrote, In the province of Tyre is a certain people who have ten castles and surrounding lands, and we have often heard that there are sixty thousands of them or more. Both we and the Saracens call them assassins, but I don't know where the name comes from. The Europeans would have to wait until 1298 to learn more about this mysterious order. That's when Rusticolor de Pisa published the Travels of Marco Polo. The Venetian traveler describes a land called Mulachet, where an old man of the mountain used to live. The man had built the largest and most beautiful garden in the world. The three canals streamed there, one for water, one for honey, one for wine. In the garden there lived boys and maidens, the most handsome in the world. In the garden were admitted only those whom the old man wanted to turn into his assassins. He drugged them with opium, and upon waking up in the garden, he let them believe that they were experiencing a vision of heaven. The next time they woke up, the old man had brought them back to the real world. Longing to return to that heaven, these young men were manipulated to become assassins on behalf of the old man. Only death as a martyr for their cause would grant them a return to the Garden of Delights. Marco Polo claims that it was for that reason that the assassins were such effective killers, and the old man was so feared that rulers in Asia would pay him a regular tribute. The alternative, of course, was death. 
Polo's account concludes by narrating how, in 1265, the lord of the Tartars, Alau, tired of this wickedness, he laid siege to the old man's fortress for three years before starving out the man of the mountain and all of his assassins. But how much of Marco Polo's account is the truth, and how much is legend, or even slander circulated by enemies? Well, we'll find out right now, because now enters the picture Hassan Sabah. Hassan Sabah was born in the year 1050 in Hwam in modern-day Iran. Hwam was and still is considered as one of the holiest cities in Shia Islam and the leading center for Muslim scholarship in Persia. His father, Ali bin Muhammad bin Jafar al Sabah al Himari, was originally Yemeni and belonged to the Twelver tradition of Shia Islam. After Hassan's birth, the Sabah family settled down in Ray, where the young Hassan received his early religious education in accordance to his father's creed. Creed. Now, before I continue, allow me to clarify some religious terms here. For example, what is the difference between Shia and Sunni Muslims? While these two factions share many spiritual beliefs and religious practices, as their schism was actually political in nature. After the death of Muhammad in 632, his advisor Abu Bakr became the first caliph, or the successor of the Prophet, tasked with leading the Islamic nation. But his leadership it was challenged by the followers of Ali, the Prophet's cousin and his son-in-law. This faction originated the Shia sect, who believed that the leadership of the Islamic nation belongs to the direct descendants of the Prophet. On the other hand, Sunni Muslims believe that the leadership of the community is not a birthright. It can and it must be earned. The Twelver tradition is the mainstream belief among Shias. It is called Twelver in reference to the twelve successors of Muhammad, the last of which, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Mahdi, is yet to return to become mankind's savior. The city of Ray, where young Hassan lived, was at the center of another Shia current, the Ismailis. They derived their name from their allegiance to Ismail, the eldest son of Imam Jafar as Sadiq. Ismailis are the second largest denomination within Shia Islam, and what differentiates them from other Shia currents is that they have a living hereditary Imam. In Ray, Hassan was introduced to the Ismaili doctrine by two prominent Dais or missionaries, Amira Zarab and Abu Nasser Siraj. Following these studies at the age of 17, I'm going to forget so many of these later names. Obviously, I know Ali and Abu Bakr, but the rest are just names. And I'm sure I may have heard them here and there. They don't stick around. Maybe if I knew them, if I heard a little bit more about him, like, oh, yeah, you know, you know this person because, you know, he juggled a rock during the battle of insert. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, that was a, okay, that was a weird one. But yeah, okay, I remember that. Like, it has to be something weird. But most of these names, I just don't know. Hassan converted to Ismailism and took an oath of allegiance to the Ismaili Imam of the time, the Fatimid Caliph al Mustansir. The Fatimid dynasty ruled the most powerful Muslim state of the era from their capital in Cairo. Despite their power, Fatimids were under constant threat from the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuks were another powerful dynasty originating from Central Asia. From there, they had swept through Persia and the Middle East, establishing a Sunni Sultanate. A newly converted Ismaili student. And Hassan, at age 22, had ventured into these territories, managing to impress Abd al Malik ibn Atash, who was the chief Ismaili Dai in the Seljuk Sultanate. He impressed him so much that he actually got a job as a missionary as well. In this delicate role, Hassan first traveled to the secret Persian Ismaili headquarters in Isfahan in Persia, deep in Seljuk territory. He then went to Cairo and Alexandria to perfect his education. During his Egyptian period, Hassan clashed with some big shots in the Ismaili organization. One in particular, the vizier or chief minister to the Fatimid court, al Afdal. The conflict revolved around the succession to the caliphate and, by extension, to the imamate. In other words, who would be the next leader? leader of the Ismailis. The current caliph, al Mustansir, had appointed as future successor his eldest son, the Imam Nizar. On the other hand, Vizier al Afdal was lobbying to install Nizar's younger brother, Mustali. This guy also happened to be his son in law. Hassan had provided his support to Nizar, which made him an enemy to the powerful Vizier. 
The outcome of this whole intrigue? First of all, a further schism within Islam, with Nazari Ismaili now rivaling Mustali Ismailis. Second outcome, Hassan was exiled by al Afdal and he returned to Persia in June of 1081. But by now, he had become the most prominent Dai for the nascent Nizari community. Over the following years, Hassan traveled all across Persia, spreading word of the Nizaris. During this period, he increased his following and he started drawing up his plans to get rid of the Seljuk occupation of his land. But what had motivated Hassan Sabar in revolting against the Seljuks? Well, he actually had three different sets of reasons. From a religious perspective, the ardently Sunni Seljuks did not hide their hostility against Shias of all sects, and the Nizaris and Ismailis may have feared for their own religious freedom. Politically, Hassan still had an allegiance to the Egyptian Fatimids, despite his exile. The Seljuks by the 1070s had stretched as far as the Sinai, threatening to uproot the Caliphate. And nationally, Hassan's revolt could have been an expression of the Persians' resentments over the alien rule of the Seljuk Turks. I'm pretty sure that Hassan had never read Sun Tzu, yet the strategy he formulated it was pure art of war. He frankly assessed the weaknesses of his faction and the weaknesses of the Seljuks. The Nizari were heavily outnumbered, while Seljuk leaders were scattered around the vast Persian territory. So how could he multiply the effectiveness of his forces? How could he deal severe blows to the occupiers without staging pitch battles on a dispersive territory? His answer was to quickly occupy the high ground and establish a series of impregnable mountain strongholds from which to launch targeted killings of political and military top brass all around the country. And as you can see, the Assassin Creed was beginning to take shape. By 1087, Hassan had concentrated his efforts for recruiting a resistance movement around the Dalem region, a traditional Shia stronghold. By September of 1090, he had taken control of the region and had seized the fortress of Alamut, the Teaching of the Eagle, located in the central Elbers Mountain in the Radbar region. He did so by cunning and peaceful means, converting in secret, one by one, the soldiers of the local garrison. Hassan made the fortress impregnable and made it self-sufficient by improving the cultivation and irrigation systems of the Alamut Valley. He also established an important library holding a vast collection of manuscripts and scientific instruments. After firmly establishing himself in Alamut, Hassan extended his influence in the region by winning more converts and expanding his network of fortresses in Rudbar. In 1091, Hassan sent one of his followers, Dai Hussein Qua'ini, to Khuhistan, near the border with modern-day Afghanistan. Hassan was successful in starting a popular uprising among local Shias seeking independence from the Seljuks. This allowed the Nazaris to gain control of several towns in Khuhistan. In less than two years after the capture of Alamut, Hassan Sabah had founded an independent territorial state for the Nizari Ismailis in the midst of the Seljuk Sultanate. The Persian Shia population, of course, saw the Seljuk Turks as invaders and oppressors. Sunni sources beg to differ, pointing to the fact that Seljuks tried to extend a friendly hand to the locals. Their Sultan Malik Shah, for example, had appointed as his vizier a Persian, Abu Ali Hassan bin Ali bin Ishaq, better known as Nizam al-Mulk, which translates as the order of the country. According to legend, Hassan and Nizam had been classmates and friends in their youth. After becoming vizier, Nizam had helped his old friend by securing him a post at the court of Malik Shah. But soon their rivalry erupted and Nizam had conspired to have Hassan exiled. This legend would make Hassan's mission one of personal revenge against his childhood friend who had betrayed him. As romantic as the story sounds, Nizam was 32 years older than Hassan and there wasn't any chance they could have been schoolmates. So what happened next was purely politically motivated. In 1092, Nizam launched a Seljuk counterattack against the Nizaris in Alamut and Kwestan, but Hassan's strategy it proved effective. His small garrison atop the easily defendable mountain strongholds was able to repel attack after attack. During the siege of Alamut, Hassan was able to extract safely his wife and daughters to another Ismaili community. He never brought them back, starting a tradition of not allowing women into the fortress. 
Hassan's next move was to go on the offensive. Lacking the numbers for a full-on military campaign, Hassan relied on his next favorite tactic, a targeted killing intended to decapitate Seljuk leadership. Hassan picked the Fadeh, or faithful who would carry out the mission, Bu Tahir. Arani. Disguised as a Safi, a Muslim mystic, the Fidai approached the litter in which his target was traveling. Swift and silent, his dagger left its sheath and it plunged itself into Arani's target. This was Nizam al Mulk. The Vizier died on the spot. The same fate befell Tahir Arani. He and the other Fidais serenely accepted the fact that their missions would be most likely suicidal. The Fidai was immediately cut down by Nizam's bodyguards. This was the first high-profile assassination carried out by the faithful soldiers of the Nizari army. Hassan and his two immediate successors ordered a total of 75 tactical killings, always aimed at high-profile targets and never at civilians. The occupiers would often retaliate with massacres among the Ismaili communities, followed by further surgical strikes on Hassan's orders. Unsurprisingly, the actions of the Fidais earned them the hatred of the Seljuks and a large part of the Sunni community. They painted them as radical extremists and proto-terrorists, and at the same time as dissolute drug addicts. This is when the Nazari Fadais became known as Hasheshin, or assassins, the users of hashish. So let's pause for a moment. Did the assassins or Hashishins actually smoke hashish? In reality, they never used that word to describe themselves. Their correct description would be the Fadais of the Nazari Ismaili army. The name it was stuck on them by Marco Polo and William of Tyre, who heard it from the enemies of the Nazari in Syria. It is true that soldiers across time have made use of recreational and prescription drugs to get themselves in the right state for battle. But here's a question for you. If you were Hassan, would you really trust a stoner with a delicate mission involving climbing castle walls, picking locks, evading guards, and stabbing a high-profile enemy? And how about them dealing with the munchies? I mean, sure, the stoner's best friend is the kebab, and that was invented by Turk soldiers, but that wasn't until 1377. So, it's not disputed that the word assassin actually comes from hashish, but it is now accepted that these highly skilled and trained warriors were not on drugs. They simply found themselves stuck with a slur thrown on them by their numerous enemies. And it did not help that the slur was a strong-sounding word, assassin, which was quickly adopted by popular European poets in the 13th and 14th centuries, one being Dante, the author of the Divine Comedy. But enough with the word of the day, let's get down to business to defeat the Turks. Shortly after the assassination of Nizam al-Mulk, the Seljuk Sultan Malik Shah also died. The causes remain mysterious. Maybe they were natural, or maybe he was poisoned. As a result, the Sultanate was plunged into chaos and a civil war between Malik's eldest son, Berkiruk, and his brother, Sunjar, supported by their half-brother, Muhammad Tapar, took place. The state was further fractured by the emergence of independent warlords. Taking advantage of the disorder, Hassan consolidated and extended his power, seizing more strategically located fortresses, extending as far as Dam Gan, 500 kilometers to the east of the Alamut headquarters, or even further to Khuzestan, a thousand kilometers to the south. Hassan, he was unstoppable. During this period, he consolidated his reputation as an austere and ascetic leader. In a short span of time, we don't know exactly when, he had both of his sons executed. Muhammad was guilty of drinking wine, while Ustad was a suspect in the death of Hassan's loyal lieutenant, Hussein Kini. The Nazari leader personally turned inwards, but... You gotta be really wanting power if you're gonna have your kids killed. Wow. Okay. Politically, he sought expansion. It is said that he never again left his castle. But in the early years of the 12th century, Hassan began sending his dyes from Alamut into Syria. Here in the Nazaris resumed their practice of establishing mountain strongholds. The most important one was the Masyaf fortress. Years later, Masyaf would be under the command of Rashid ad-Din. He achieved fame due to his numerous attempts to assassinate Saladin. And it was he, not Hassan, who gave rise to the legend of the Old Man of the Mountain. And it was them, the Syrian assassins, who would first make contact with the Templars. I will take a quick detour now to cover the relationship between these two groups, even if it's out of the scope of Hassan's life. 
A certain media franchise has painted these two organizations as mortal rivals through the ages and across continents. These two factions had much in common, though, if you think about it. Both were a core of elite warriors motivated by both a political and a religious drive. Both would be at some point slandered and accused of being heretics by powerful enemies. The tension between assassins and Templars in the Levant or the Holy Land never escalated into a full clash. There were some hostilities, but the two sometimes they were allies, as the Syrian Nazari were more interested in fighting other Muslim enemies rather than the Christians. From 1152, they interacted almost like mob cartels with assigned territories, wary of stepping too much on each other's toes. In their year, the Fides had claimed one of their few Christian victims, Count Raymond of Tripoli. In reparation, the Templars in Lebanon demanded a tribute of 2,000 bezants a year. Sounds a bit like protection money, doesn't it? On another occasion, it was the Syrian assassins who demanded protection money from none other than King Louis IX of France when he was visiting Acha in modern-day Israel. If the king paid, the old man of the mountain would let him live. Grand Master Joinville of the Templars intervened and sent the envoy back home empty-handed, but with a non-aggression pact between the king and the old man. But enough with ruining video games, let's get back to Hassan, shall we? In 1097, the Imam Nizar, spiritual leader to Hassan and his men, was killed in Cairo. His rival, Vizier al Afdal, had buried him alive between two walls. When the news reached Hassan, he sent for Nizar's young son to be rescued from Cairo and to be brought to safety at Alamut. Until now, Hassan Sabah had been the political and military leader of the Nizari in Persia. From now on, in the absence of a manifest imam, he would serve also as the religious leader of the whole Nizari community. In the last years of the 11th century, Hassan launched an offensive on the heart of the Seljuk Sultanate. The objective was the fortress of Shandiz, close to the capital of Ifashan. His agent for the operation was Ahmad bin Atash, the son of Hassan's first teacher after he had become an Ismaili. But Ahmad did not use the dagger, only his faith. One by one, he converted the children and then the soldiers of the garrison. By 1100, Ahmad and the Nazaris had successfully infiltrated and occupied the castle. And with that, the road to Isfahan was open. But eventually, the Nazari did not achieve victory, at least not a total one. In the meantime, the warring Seljuk brothers Berkiruk, Sanjar, and Muhammad Tapar had agreed to a truce in order to combat Hassan. The newly united Seljuks fought back and secured Isfahan. The Nazari retaliated with more assassinations, which were followed by massacres of Nazari civilians. In 1105, Tapar became the Sultan. Four years later, he launched a second siege of Alamut, eager to close the Nazari nuisance once and for all. At the heads of his army was Ahmad al Mulk, the son of the Vizier Nizam, who was assassinated in 1092. But once again, Alamut held on. By assault or by attrition, Alamut, he would not fall. <laughs> The ongoing war had reached a stalemate. By the time of Muhammad Tapar's death in 1118, the Nazaris were still successfully defending important, albeit scattered, territories which amounted to an independent Nazari state. But a total victory and conquest of Persia from the hands of the Seljuks it was out of the question. In these years of stalemate, Hassan withdrew even more from the outside world, spending most of his time inside his personal quarters at Alamut, reading books, committing the teachings of his doctrine to writing, and administering the affairs of his realm. In 1124, aged 74, Hassan sensed that he was reaching the end of his life. He summoned Kia Bazurg Umid, a trusted lieutenant from the Lamassar fortress, and designated him as his successor in Alamut. Hassan Sabah died after a brief illness on the 12th of June 1124 and was buried near Alamut, the fortress that had been his home and the symbol of his power for so many years. The Nazari Fadais, or assassins if you like, continued to harass the Seljuks and other foes in Persia for the following 100 years. Nazari worshippers regularly visited Hassan's mausoleum until a new unstoppable enemy swept through Central Asia and Persia, and that was the Mongols. In 1256, they laid the final siege to Alamut. The proud fortress, the teaching of the eagle, eventually fell and was demolished. The assassins, they remained active in Syria, but their legend had come to an end in the place that had been their first home. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit So that was completely different than what I expected. I don't know why. I learned about three of his, uh, the assassin 
the assassinations. And I knew it was going to be about his life, but most of the names I just don't know. I have no idea. Still, it was a good video, still very good. But yeah, I wonder if uh, you, I mean, if I'm sure he's still buried there today. I wonder if there's like a mausoleum or something like that for him. That's interesting. Very interesting. Hmm. Well, not much else I can add here. So we're going to end the video. And uh, if you know of any other videos related to him or the, um, was it, I always butcher the name, Isma Ismailis. Yeah, the Ismailis. If you know anything with them, that would be good because I would like to watch more about them. But until then, have a good day, have a good night.